Yeah. And, and um, I would like to hand over, maybe you could give us a brief input again, and that might um, get people to, to um, um, what they put, remember what they put last week and, and, uh, and the questions they had to get into it again. And um, um, as I said, I also think that most people read, um, actually watched the video online. <laughs> So, um, and there are still people coming in, they are almost 30 by now, which I think is very amazing. It's really a good result <laughs> that after all that time, um, we still have people interested and um, staying with us and being active in the MOOC as, and also in the, in the discussion forums. It's really very encouraging and very and really amazing what's going on there. So, thanks for joining in and okay Leah said I should speak a little bit up <clears throat> I'll try to speak louder but um, as I said I'd like to hand over to um, Richard now maybe he could um, give us uh, a few words again about um, um, last week's topic all right put up the sound. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, well, the last week's presentation was uh, meant to introduce uh, why participation is needed in the economic valuation. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that, uh, because uh, not only should we consider the economics, but we should also consider the ecological sustainability and the social fairness of land use and, and management. And, and to do that, um, we need to ensure that we're getting the views of the people who, who are using the land, who are managing the land. Um, and we also need to get their views on what are those uh, ecosystem services that are important and which ones uh, should get priority in terms of uh, valuing them. Uh, and, that, and that's been shown in several studies that often uh, when outsiders attempt to do this, they, they often uh, get the priorities uh, wrong in terms of uh, which ecosystem services are, are really important. And so what, what I did uh, last week was to in, introduce why, why participation is important and, and more practically where where it's needed in terms of the methodology that's proposed from the ELD. And you can see up on the slide there, the, the methodology, the six uh, plus one steps, and uh, I've highlighted in, in orange there where, where uh, participation is particularly uh, important. And that starts right at the very beginning through consultations on, on understanding the environment, uh, the the context, etc. Um, then developing a picture of where um, ecosystem services are in the environment, uh, putting that onto things like uh, models, and these can be GIS models, but in terms of working with a community, even a mock-up three-dimensional model of something like a watershed is extremely useful to get people uh, participating in, in deciding where the water is a problem, where uh, forests are, are needed, etc. And that helps uh, with this participatory identification of the ecosystem services. But it also goes into issues of what people on the ground think are important in terms of their, their livelihoods. Um, and that's done through key informants and focus groups in, in study villages. From that, uh, we then can take that information and begin to build up uh, uh, at least a partial uh, economic value. And that usually uh, needs to involve modeling and the development of scenarios, which is mainly done by so-called experts, but there are also means to develop very simple throwaway models that you can work with in a participatory uh, way too. And some of you may have had uh, experience of, of doing that. And then the, the final uh, step where this is clearly important is when uh, 
you develop uh, community management plans or negotiated action plans that uh, take into account all the different aspects of the ecosystem services and the different viewpoints of people so that you can get a, a, at least a consensus on, on what's important, what should be valued. So that's basically um, what I was trying to bring into the, the 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 MOOC uh, last week, and I'm just wondering if um, any of you have any experience of uh, this sort of participation from the group, or is this uh, new new for you? Yes, yes uh, I, I, I'm Naomi, yes. sorry. <laughs> participants uh, today. Um, just, okay, people start doing new, new. Okay, the, uh, good. Chat window, and most people simply say new, it's new to them. In case anybody has been participating or any experience. Okay, Daniel, maybe. Um, he or she, um, please raise your hand and we give you the micro. Okay, Paul says not only these approaches and methods are new, but the whole MOOC. <laughs> and Paul, that's welcome to the club. That's, um, for most of us, that's the case. I hope it's still a good experience as it has been for me. <laughs> okay. Jose, first yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Daniel, Daniel could share his okay. experience. Daniel, can you get online, Daniel? Uh, did Did you have to use any incentives to to get people to participate in this? And if you did, what what were they? I think that's quite interesting, um, because he also um, coming from um, development cooperation ownership is of course one of the key words for me. And um, and uh, sustainability, of course. Um, so he. Ex Explained us or uh, showed us um, a little bit the different steps: project inception, community mapping, validation, and also um, answer the question of um, uh, Richard uh, regarding incentives. Maybe you could also, in, in commenting on this, um, Richard, wrap it up a little bit, and for the others later on for the um, is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Uh, I, I think uh, the question of incentives is is quite important. Um, uh, we obviously we're, we're trying to avoid financial incentives because that was the, the sort of approach of the past, and and that tends not to work uh, because once the project uh, is over, people move away, then then things don't continue. So we try and avoid that. Uh, but there are various other incentives, and you can see it up there on, on the slides. Uh, competitions between farmers is is a very good uh, thing to to um, attempt. And, and also um, this idea of the paraecologist, somebody's asked me to explain that, so I, I will. But I'll just add one more thing in that uh, in the methodology we talk about uh, – collating the information and putting it onto something like a map or a, or a GIS. But often when you're working with communities um, who are perhaps uh, not highly educated, uh, sometimes a two-dimensional image is extremely diff difficult for them to, to understand. And so one of the, the methods I used in uh, Latin America was to develop a very simple three-dimensional model of their environment and you leave it in the environment and people gather around and talk about it and then they begin to point out where where the water sources are and things like that. That's an extremely useful way of getting people involved and participating. Now, the paraecologist idea is basically um, to 
use local people and to train them in in a minimum amount of information of uh, things like monitoring uh, ecosystem services, things like monitoring biodiversity. Um, People from the community who are interested in their environment will work with some qualified people to have very simple uh, methods to measure things like the water quality or the biodiversity. And that was very successfully tried in, in South Africa uh, with a GIZ project called Biota. And I think that work is still going on. Um, and there you off, offer things like um, local people are given some sort of certificate to once they've completed the course, and they that gives them a lot of confidence uh, and kudos in, in their environment. So that helps them continue the monitoring and evaluation because you would appreciate that um, the valuation in terms of economics is, is not just a one-time thing. You, the initial valuation is the baseline, if you like, and you need to be able to go back. And it's very useful to have people who are at least partly trained to gather that information and to discuss it amongst the community. So that's that's the idea. Oops, sorry, someone's corrected me. A biota was not a GIZ project. Oops, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, how do you select how do you select a piece with opinions and process? Yeah, I think um, Selection of people involved in this is also extremely important because you have to be aware of the the power structure within the communities and certain individuals will come forward and offer themselves and maybe they have some some agenda there and so you need to have a, a great deal of local knowledge about uh, what are the different groupings, uh, how people interact, uh, things like that, to ensure that you have uh, a truly representative uh, group of people there and be aware of the, of the different power structures. Uh, that is uh, always a problem in, in this type of work, um, but you need to have uh, consult with several different people from the local uh, communities the village leaders, if there are NGOs there, the local government offices as well, so that you you do your best to ensure that uh, the groups, the people that are working on this are, are not uh, um, biased in any way. Uh, okay, good. Uh, Volker, you've, you've added some more information on, on the Biota project. I know that it was uh, my contact there was through the University of Hamburg. Yes. Um, so if you want to add anything to that. Funded, but it was not a GSF project. Uh, okay. Mm, thank you for uh, thank you for that correction. Um, Okay, Thomas Falk again said that we have more para-ecologists in the new, the future of Kavango project. Um, yes, Thomas Falk is also going to give a presentation. Ah, oh, good, and very good. Discuss, um, um, if he would like to raise a question or add something, um, Thomas, you are very welcome to do so right now. Just raise your hands and I will give you the microphone. If not, I'll try to upload a few questions for that shit. So it looks like Thomas will will uh, will go into more detail on on the paraecologist next week. So.
Yes, actually, so these were the questions the team here collected. Okay, very inspiring, Thomas said. And he will speak next week, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> sure, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay, so maybe um, um, Richard, if you would like to come back to these questions. On the questions, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think there are some examples, uh, and I, I, I can't pick them out top, out top of my head, but we've got some examples in the case studies in the ELD where where some of those issues came up. Um, what's, what's important to realize is that uh, this is very much an, an iterative process. Uh, it's not a one-time process, and so you can start off with let's say, uh, a first cut at which ecosystem services may be important, but then as you work through things and as you hold uh, meetings with uh, the groups, that, that will often often change depending on, on who is there. So um, it's, yes, you could call it subjective, but through this iterative process, you come to a sort of consensus of what are the key um, the key issues. There's an example that I've quoted, and, and there's a, a reference in the bibliography uh, from Latin America on the use of what's called photo voice, where people are encouraged to go out into their communities and take photographs of the, the things they think are important in terms of ecosystem services. Uh, there was a case with the pine plantation work that seems to um, illustrate this quite well, because people were actually afraid to say too much, especially if representatives from the company were present, but they brought photographs uh, of, I can't remember what it was, pol pollution or deforestation. And then the photograph was the key to open up the, a more uh, viable discussion on what are the the ecosystem services and how they are important to different people. So the photographs uh, are, are a very powerful tool. And again, they help get over the potential problems with imbalance of power in terms of uh, groups, organizations, and local people. And now that people have more and more access to things like mobile phones, where these uh, images can be shared quite quickly. I think this is uh, this will be a, an important uh, tool that people can use to make it, if you like, more objective and, and come to a consensus uh, where the key ecosystem services are. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, what? Yes, please, the, go ahead. The, the second question, yes, this is definitely an issue. Have you found that the incentive sustainability and long-term benefits has less weight than short-term benefits? Yes, it's it's absolutely essential when we're dealing with uh, these rural communities, uh, poor people who are basically not far away from uh, subsistence living, uh, that whatever is... Uh, brought in, in terms of incentives, that has to have a, an immediate payback for the people involved. Otherwise, it's extremely difficult to, to get them uh, involved and, and committed. So, yes, long-term benefits. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, an, an important point and, and requires quite a bit of thought in terms of how you can bring in the immediate uh, incentives and benefits and at the same time uh, consider the long, longer term options. And this is where building the scenarios with people comes in because then you can, the scenario is you know, a probable future, if you like. And that's where you can start to bring in issues of longer-term sustainability when you talk about uh, different options and different scenarios uh, in the particular environment. 
Okay, right. let's see. Someone's got a third question. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, the 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 two-dimensional image versus three-dimensional image. It, this is uh, extremely helpful uh, for people who who have difficulty with understanding two dimensions. And it's basically uh, you use a very simple. Uh, model you can make it out of polystyrene you can make it out of clay you can make it out of local material um, it can be any size uh, that you want it can be very crude but it, as long as it represents the let's say the watershed if it's a watershed um, that also breaks down some of the barriers we have between scientists for example and local people because for scientists using things like GIS it's it's very simple but uh, the work that I was involved with in, in Latin America definitely showed that that was a big barrier in terms of uh, helping people understand what was happening in, in their environment so a three-dimensional model was actually much much better so very simple tools uh, uh, methods to, to do that. Um, you can involve school children in, in, in building these uh, models. Um, they work very well. Have The fourth question, have power structures proven problematic in the past? Yes, I, I think that's fairly uh, clear that there have been problems with, with power structures and, and this is a big issue of when you you don't do a complete job of understanding the environment and and ensuring that you've got representatives from all the the stakeholders and again the the example i can give you on that is is in one of the slides um if i can go back let me try and go back to the slide how do i go back okay the, the example from Syria that I used, yeah, this one. There were, uh, this was, a, as you can see, the uh, a wetland in, in Syria. Uh, it was a seasonal wetland. In other words, it floods and then dries out. There were very different groups involved in that. There was a private sector uh wanted to establish a fisheries in this uh, lake and they were they had a lot of power in terms of being able to influence the local government for licensing of the the fisheries but when we had that large group of uh, of stakeholders involved, and I hope I can, yes, this one, you can see there were a large number of government uh, institutions involved, research institutions, development projects, civil society. So when representatives from those different entities formed the committee, that helped to, in a way, dilute this power imbalance because in this particular example there were enough voices in the committee to say no establishing a fisheries in here is going to harm the local flora it will affect uh, probably affect uh, things like the bird migration which is a, a big tourism aspect of this particular environment and that sort of pressure from the committee actually stopped the granting of the license to the fisheries company. So that's an example of how when you have as many stakeholders as possible, you can overcome some of these uh, power or power imbalances that you see. And, and as, as you're all aware, uh, you often get uh, elite groups uh, dominating these sorts of uh, arrangements for their own benefits. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there, were, there was another question actually um, uh, about the tools and the and pictures um, referring before um, from Thomas. And um, he was asking with? whether you would work with aerial photographs. Um, and Natalie also said that would be interesting for her. 
Um, maybe you could um, just answer this question. Yeah, uh, personally, I, I haven't uh, used aerial photographs, but uh, yes, that's um, that's another technique you can use. But uh, again, some people still have problems with uh, two-dimensional images. Uh, but aerial photographs, particularly over a, a time course, can be can be very useful in terms of showing uh, an area that's subject to flooding, for example, or for erosion, and uh, the big effect you can have by not protecting uh, the soil, uh, because you can show things like um, gully erosion um, in in those sort of time sequences of aerial photographs, and and I have use things like uh, balloons for, for cameras, uh, not in a developing country uh, situation, but in, you don't have to have aircraft or drones or things like that. You can actually use uh, balloons to, to lift cameras up. And there are much more sophisticated techniques now that are coming down in price. Yes, thank you. I hope that answered your question. Um, very interesting coming from um, the e-learning, mobile learning um, yeah. background. I know how important visualization of content and of um, data is and how important it can be. And also, um, of course, about the increasing importance of uh, mobile technologies, especially in Africa, but worldwide, of course, and um, what we can do with these. Um, interesting how it will develop. Um, okay, um, so I can't see any more questions in the chat. So um, if you agree, I would open the discussion to, um, okay, there's another um, comment from Daniel, who used aerial photographs to dominate watershed boundaries. There are there is slope starts looking three dimensional. Okay, so there are more experiences with these. Interesting. Okay, so that might go on the discussion in the chat, but um, I uh -huh. would um, welcome people to um, uh, raise their hands and um, and um, ask more questions or comment on. Um, on today's topic, which turned out to be the same as last week, but um, <laughs> and, uh, so, <laughs> but it, it's very important. So, and, and, um, I, I, I think it's good that we did have this chance. And so please um, go ahead and um, ask questions, but you might, of course, um, might as well um, um, address other issues or make other comments or ask other questions not directly to related to this, however you like. So I would open this up now and um, would welcome people to um, to ask um, questions directly, not through the chat. And um, in order to do that, please just raise your hand click by clicking on the hand icon up there in the upper left hand corner. Okay, Paul also refers again to aerial photographs. Okay, all right. So please go ahead, don't be afraid. Just raise your hand and um, we'll give you the micro or the webcam also. Okay. Don't hesitate, just go ahead. Okay, Tobias asked Paul to tell us more about this and his experiences. I know Paul Gwalia from, um, from um, trainings in Africa. Um, would you like to do, to go ahead? and um, just say a few words about your experiences. Oh, he said he has no microphone. He's in the office. 
unfortunately. <laughs> but okay, maybe we could still um, use the chat and ask this question. Okay, there's another question from Jose also in the chat. How many people is advisable to have in a participatory shop? I think you put there in the chat window. Maybe um, Richard? Yeah, this, um, well, it depends on, on the different groupings, of course, the different uh, organizations and people interested. But normally you, you start off with a, a fairly large group uh, of people, even 30 to 50 people. And then when you begin to uh, delineate certain uh, things that you want to focus on, uh, you usually work with uh, smaller, smaller numbers of people, maybe, maybe five to six people. Uh, because it's very difficult to to um, get through a lot of work with uh, a large group. So again, this is part of the iterative process that you need to engage in. Um, some people, uh, there should be a lot of people there at the beginning, but then as you work through things, uh, normally people uh, lose a little bit of interest if it's not directly uh, of their interest. So, that's how you, you work through that, through this iterative process. You also need, of course, the, the skills of, uh, of a facilitator. This is uh, extremely important. And these people are actually not very hard to, not very easy to find. Uh, most scientists, for example, are, are not trained in this field. So, um, Finding those champions, those people who are committed and those people who will be open and fair and are able to facilitate discussions in a community are, are, are key steps in this. All right, yeah. I mean, um, you can imagine that this is not really an easy task to moderate and workshop of participatory shops. Um, no. <laughs> especially if there, um, yeah, the language, if there's the language problem involved, which I, I suppose is quite often the case. And um, yeah. the different interests and also, also probably um, the um, environment and cultural, cross-cultural issues and stuff like that. Okay, are there any other questions? No, nobody wants to say something or show his face or her face. No, you have the chance. Okay, I can't see any hands raised. Okay, there's something, another one in the chat. When we talk, uh, that's from Liberty. When we talk about participatory, it makes sense to have a mix of expertise. Is there any ground rules that must apply to some, for instance, representatives from local government? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think any anyone who has an influence on the state of the environment or on the the what happens with the products that are produced from from the ecosystem services. Uh, people who benefit from the ecosystem services, they they should be involved. And you know what what we hope will happen in in the ELD is that we can break these uh, barriers between uh, local people and and policymakers. So it's always extremely useful to have at least some policymakers. Uh, working alongside the local communities. And these can be people from the local government, from the regional government, or, or the national government. Um, th these are our key uh, participants in these sorts of uh, discussions. And I think in the future, we may well see uh, people from the private sector being engaged in, in these sorts of meetings too, particularly if they are active in, in the region. Um, 
the forward-looking private sector companies are now open to this and uh, actively seeking this sort of engagement. So if there's, for instance, uh, a plantation uh, operating, it's it's useful to have representatives from there, from local NGOs, from local communities, from the village elders or the local governments, etc. These are more or less essential to have these people uh, as part of the process. Okay, thank you very much. And it seems that the question of the pictures and so on is still very interesting for people mm. and participants. Yeah. And then some refer to the sources available on the internet, a lot of them free of charge. There are many pro projects now, but also, and somebody was referring here to Google Earth, I think, Google Earth Pro. Hannes, what's that? Um, about the pictures and just software. And there's another comment from Andrew. Maybe we should um, take this up in the forum on the MOOC because it's easy yeah. to put links there and also um, put examples. And um, I think that's a discussion about the um, pictures and so on, and this kind of data and media, which, um, which fits very well to, to, the, um, to this format of a forum discussion or a new thread in, in the forum, um, where people can put, uh, can give input. Um, yeah. I, I've just put up some links there where, particularly in response to Andrew's uh, question about uh, how do we get this fair representation? That's uh, uh, we dealt with that a little bit in in the Syrian case that uh, is up there under the the reference uh, called ICADA 2010, and I, I sort of uh, partly answered that earlier on when I mentioned uh, that particular case. Okay. If there are no, no more questions, I would say let's finish this session. And it has become a tradition to um, greet each other at the end of um, this session um, and to show each other and switch on the cameras. Um, um, but before we do that, I would like to come.